Hi everyone, I'm Pastor Rick White. I'm very excited to be here with you again today from Grace Online Church. And today we're going to continue our series on the top 10 stinking lies from the pulpit. Um, and today's lie is you can lose your salvation. Now this has been around for a long time and it's a big controversy in Christianity and evangelical Christianity it has been forever. About 50%, or I would say more than 50%, I don't have the exact numbers, believe in a concept called eternal security. Calvin called it the perseverance of the saints. And that means that once you're saved, you can't be not saved. You can't be unborn again. Um, detractors call it once saved, always saved, as if that's a bad thing. Oh, you, you believe in that once saved, always saved stuff. Yes. Yes, I do, because God doesn't do anything incompletely. But let's uh, look at it, because I'm going to give you today some verses that I think settle the issue. And I'm also going to show you some verses that people who believe you're, you can lose your salvation use. And I'm going to show you what's wrong with those verses and the way they're interpreting them. So before we start, let's pray. Father, um, Thank you again for this privilege. We know how important this message is. And so I pray that you would help me be clear and that all that would come forth would be uh, your pure doctrine, your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. This matters, by the way, because if you don't understand this, you will live a life of worry, defeat, and legalism. This is a key to throwing away legalism forever. Now, I want to start with John chapter 6, verses 35 through 37. And this won't be the only scripture, but this scripture almost nails the concept shut on whether you can lose your salvation. So let's read this. John 6, 35. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty but you haven't believed in me, even though you have seen me. However, those the Father has given me will come to me, and I will never reject them. For I have come down from heaven to do the will of God who sent me, not to do my own will. And this is the will of God, that I should not lose even one of all those he has given me, but that I should raise them up on the last day. For it is my Father's will that all who see His Son and believe in Him should have eternal life. I will raise them up at the last day. So let's, let's take this apart a little bit. First thing I want you to notice is the word never. The word never is in there several times. First of all, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Now, you know what never means. I don't have to define that word for you. It means it's not going to happen. Now, does that mean that Christians are never hungry in their stomach? No, that's not what Jesus is talking about. That's why he says, I am the bread of life. He's talking about spiritual life, the hunger to know that you are loved and accepted and forgiven by God, the thirst to know that the creator of the universe accepts you and loves you. Jesus says, if you come to me, you'll never have that thirst again. Notice, he doesn't say, you won't be thirsty until you mess up and deny Jesus or do something else, and then after that, you'll be thirsty again. He doesn't say that. Next, uh, never is, yeah, he who believes in me will never be thirsty. So we have never be hungry, never be thirsty. Here's another one, verse 37. However, those the Father has given me will come to me and I will never reject them. Now again, I say this a lot of Sundays, I didn't choose the word never. So let's just, let's just talk about these verses for a second. To me, there's such a clear definition or such a clear defense 
of eternal security. Here's what Jesus says. He talks about a process. The process says the Father gives people to Jesus, right? Verse 37, however, those that the Father has given me will come to me. It doesn't say some of those that the Father has given me. It says those that the Father has given to me will come. It doesn't say will come if they make a decision to come. It says they're going to come. And I will never reject them. Never. If you come to Jesus, you've been given to Jesus by God and you come to him, he will never, ever, ever for eternity ever reject you. He will never look at you and say, ah, you've messed up. You got to get, you know, get away from me for a while till you figure your stuff out. Or, you know, you've got to go get a little more holy. Never. So again, the process, the father gives people to Jesus, all of them that he gives come to Jesus. And verse 39, and this is the will of God that I should not lose even one of all that he has given me, but I should, just in case we didn't get it, raise them up at the last day. Now that's not talking about the general resurrection that everybody gets resurrected. And we know that because verse 40 says, It's my Father's will that all who see His Son and believe should have eternal life. So you're resurrected to eternal life. And just in case we didn't get it, he says, and I will raise them up on the last day. So it is really difficult to interpret this set of verses with the paradigm of my behavior can cause me to lose my salvation. If that's the case then Jesus lied here. At very least, he lied by omission, right? He should have at least put in there, oh, by the way, now if you walk away from God, then he will abandon you or then he will reject you. Not what it says. It says the word never over and over again. I encourage you to study this verse, these verses. Actually, it's, it's John 6, 35 to 40. Look at all of those, John 6, 35 to 40. Um, and that's the New, uh, New Living Translation. Here's another verse. John 10, 27 to 29 says, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. There's that word again, never perish. No one can snatch them away from me, For my Father has given them to me, and he is more powerful than anyone else. No one can snatch them from the Father's hand. Again, these are the words of Jesus. Now, I know we talked a few weeks ago that sometimes when Jesus was speaking, he was speaking to show how difficult it is to become a Christian and to be acceptable to God based on the law, right? So he told the one guy he's got to sell everything. When he's talking like that, he, is, he has a purpose, and his purpose is to show that we're hopeless without him. But then when he talks like this, he has another purpose, and that purpose is the gospel, the good news. He's telling you, after I die, I've got, I'm pre- preparing this scenario for you, that you come to me, and the Father accepts you, and will never turn his back on you, and I will never turn his back on you. That last verse we read in John says, no one, not even you. I mean, are you part of no one can snatch you out of my father's hands? You're part of that. So that means even you. But what about free will? You know, that's what we hear. What about free will? Listen, you have a very limited free will. Those who preach that free will is sovereign and that God's done everything and it's up to you to make a choice. And if you don't choose the right thing, you have undone all of God's work because God really wanted you, but you didn't get it. So God doesn't get what he wants. We don't have that kind of limited free will. Let me give you a couple examples. Um, And if you want to read more about this, I really recommend you check out Martin Luther's book called The Bondage of the Will. What he discusses in there is is simply this. 
we do have limited freedom of will. I can decide to go to the store. I can, you know, make all kinds of choices. But our free will is within a bound. It's, it's, it, it's got a boundary around it. Let me give you a different example. A dog is free to bark. A dog is not free to meow. Even if he wants to, he can't because he's not that kind of creature. He's not. So he's not free to be something he's not. Now, how does that apply to what we're talking about? Well, the Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. The Bible says the natural man receiveth not the things of God. So guess what? You in yourself, in your natural self, without God's intervention, are not free to make a decision for Christ. That's horrible theology. You're not free to make a decision for Christ. Not when the word says that your thoughts are only evil continually and there's none righteous, no, not one. Let me ask you a question. Does it please God if you accept Jesus? Of course it does. But guess what? Dead, unsaved people can't please God. We're dead to him. Another example would be Lazarus. Let me ask you a question. Lazarus was in the tomb for three days. His sisters, Martha and Mary, said, man, don't even go in there. It's going to smell. I mean, they knew he was dead. There was no doubt that he was dead. What did Jesus say? He says, ah, I got it. He's only sleeping. He didn't really mean he was just taking a nap. He meant in Christ, death is asleep. It's a little bit of a sleep from the earthly perspective, but we're not gone. And he called out, Lazarus, come forth. Now, let me ask you a question. Did Lazarus have to accept whether he should come forth or not? No. You know why? Because he was dead. Dead people don't make choices. And spiritually, we're dead. Spiritually, we can't make a choice to serve God. So we don't have unlimited free will. We have a certain kind of free will. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't sin after we're a Christian. Of course, we do. What it means is that your salvation didn't come based on what you do. And it can't be lost based on what you do. You did nothing to earn it. So you can do nothing to lose it. Just to uh, reiterate what I said a second ago, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 says, The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. So guess what? The gospel is foolishness to those who do not have the Spirit of God living in them. You didn't accept the gospel by making a decision in your brain. The Spirit of God was already working in you, and all of a sudden your mind and your eyes were opened, and that's how you accepted the gospel. Now, I got a question for you. If you accepted it and got saved not based on your works, how possibly could you lose it based on your works? In fact, in Galatians, you know, Paul talks about this a lot. He says, you foolish Galatians, you started out by grace through faith, and now you're trying to live this Christian life by works. Romans 8. We have a lot of scriptures today. Romans 8 says, can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity? or are persecuted, or hungry, or destitute, or in danger, or threatened with death. As the scriptures say, for your sake we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all of these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or the earth below, indeed nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love that God has revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. You can't separate yourself from it. Couple more, Philippians 1.6, I am certain that God who began this good work in you will continue his work 
until it's finally finished on the day that Christ Jesus returns. You should, everyone should remember that verse. Does it say, and I am certain that you will finish your work so that you'll be acceptable to God? I am certain that if you're a Christian, you will learn how to behave. <laughs> Is that what it says? It says, I am certain that God, who began a good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ returns. God's going to be working on us forever, but it's his work. It's not your work. This is important. Um, another verse. I know there's a lot of verses, but listen, we need these verses. You know why? Because there are people out there that are going to try to rob you of your assurance of salvation. And there may be people watching this who've already been robbed of that, who think, man, I don't know if I'm going to heaven. Listen, listen to this. 1 Peter 1, 4. And we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change or decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. Man, there's some really significant things in that verse. It says that our inheritance, which is salvation, is kept where? In heaven, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change or decay. You think you can change your eternal destiny? This says you can't. That it's being kept safe as an inheritance for you in heaven. You can't change it. It's being kept safe from what? Change and decay. I'm changing all the time. I decay. We are all dying. We are all getting a little bit closer to the end of our lives with every passing day. And also, the, the longer I'm a Christian, the more I kind of see the the weakness and the, and the sinfulness of my own flesh. So I don't feel like I'm getting better, but it doesn't matter because you know why? 1 Peter 1, 4 says, my inheritance, my salvation isn't here. It's being kept for me, safe and secure by God himself in heaven. And you think you can mess that up? Losing your salvation is a lie from the pit of hell. Now, there's a verse that people use all the time to talk about how you can lose your salvation. And we're going to talk, talk about it. It's Hebrews 6, verses 4 through 6. It says this, For it is impossible to bring back to repentance those who were once enlightened, those who have experienced the good things of heaven and shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the power of the age to come, and who then turn away from God it is impossible to bring such people back to repentance. By rejecting the Son of God, they themselves are nailing him to the cross again and holding him up to public shame. So this verse is used to say that if you totally embraced Christianity, you know, you repented, you shared the Spirit, you've tasted the goodness of heaven, all these things, and then turn away from God, it is impossible to bring such people back to repentance. Let's stop right there. First of all, those who interpret this verse to say this is talking about losing your salvation must move from our position of once saved, always saved to once lost, always lost. Because that's what this says. If that's what this is talking about, this says you can't repent. If you've been a Christian and tasted it and then you fall away, you can't repent, if that's what this means. Now, i got to ask you a question. Does the rest of the New Testament give you that impression? No. God says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. Everything else we've read up to this point gives you a different impression. So what does that tell you? Whenever you run into a situation like that, where you've got 15, 20, 30 verses that all are consistent, and then you read this one, and it seems to contradict them, you're not understanding the verse. It's either that or God's confusing. And the Bible says that God's not the author of confusion. So what does this verse really mean? Well, there's two thoughts out there. And um, I'll, I'll give you both of them. And I, I'm kind of 50-50. I'm not exactly sure which one. I think I lean more towards the first one. The first thought is 
This is saying, if it were ever possible for an, uh, a saved person to lose their salvation, then it'd be all over, right? Because they can't, you can't go back to repentance. It's not saying you can. It's saying it would be impossible to bring back those to repentance who were re once enlightened because they'd be crucifying Jesus again. Get it? He died once. So he's saying even the whole concept of a Christian falling away it's impossible because to, to bring them back and get them saved again would be to crucify Jesus again. So this concept of once saved, always saved, or once saved, but then I can lose it and get resaved, resaved, this contradicts resaved altogether. It says you can't go back. So it can't be talking about that. I believe it's, it's, there's a very good chance that that interpretation is, is the right one, which says, you know, just to give you an example. You know, let's, let's, let's say a, a, a Christian, quote, fell away. What's he going to do? You can't crucify Jesus again. His point is, even that falling away, all of this Christian's sins have been dealt with at the crucifixion. It's saying the opposite, that you lose your salvation. It's saying, no, of course you didn't lose your salvation. Your salvation was secure when Jesus died. We're not going to crucify him again every time you sin. You see the difference? The other interpretation is that when you sin, Christian, you didn't lose your salvation. So you're going to sin. It might even look like you fell away. But you don't go back to repentance. You don't go back to getting resaved. It's impossible. That's, a, that's another way to look at it. But what this doesn't say is that once you're saved, you can lose your salvation permanently. And what it definitely doesn't say is that you can go up and down like a roller coaster. And that's what most people who are against eternal security use this verse to say. See, you can lose your salvation. Well, if that's what this verse says, you can never get it back. If this verse is talking about losing your salvation, then you must preach once lost, always lost. Because this says it's impossible to go back. So that can't be what it means. Let me show you kind of what, it, what I think an, another way to look at this is. In Matthew 7, verse 21, Jesus said, Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and performed many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. Now, some people think that these are people who got saved. But check it out. There's a couple of things in here. First of all, it says, only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. People, legalists take that verse and say, see, you've got to obey everything. But we've seen already in previous weeks, the will that Jesus is talking about of his father is to believe in him who he has sent. That's what he's talking about here. You know why we can know that? He's not talking about works because he just lists a bunch of people who say, hey, we, we did works. We prophesied, we cast out demons, we performed miracles. We did some stuff, God. And what does he say? I never knew you. Never. So you did stuff in my name, but you never had a relationship with me. You did not get saved. So he says, get away from me, you who break God's laws. He can never say that to you and me. You know why? Because our breaking of God's laws has been covered and paid for, and we have been declared not guilty. So you who break God's laws are people who did not get saved. So once again, there is no verse, there is no place in the Bible that talks about Christians losing their salvation. Psalm 103.12 says, He has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. Interesting thought. Think about this. They didn't know the world was round back then. In the future, when we discover scientific facts, we see that God knew them all along. Let me give you an example. If you start going south from the North Pole and continue south. Once you get around the South Pole, you're going north. So south meets north and north meets south. 
But if you start going around the equator east, you will never start going west. East never meets west. It doesn't say north never meets south. It says east never meets west. And that's how far away God has removed our sins from us. Shame on anyone who tries to put us under our sins. Shame on you. God has removed them as far as the east is from the west. But man, that's what legalists do all the time. Don't let them do that to you. So let me ask you a question. This is a lie, right? This is one of the top 10 stinking lies from the pulpit. Well, who would tell you this lie? I think our three enemies would tell you this lie. Our three enemies are the world, the flesh, and the devil. The world, not just heathens, not just the goats, but what about wolves in sheep's clothing? What about pastors that teach false doctrine? That's the world. It's not God. So the world would tell you this lie that, hey, you could lose your salvation, so make sure you're living up. The flesh, your fallen nature, will condemn you. The voices in your head, your own sense of wanting to be good and wanting to be better will condemn you. It'll tell you, you messed up again. And the devil is called the accuser of the brethren. Of course he's going to tell you this lie. Listen, at one time you loved God, but you've really lost your salvation. You're just like everyone else and you're going to hell. That's a lie from the pit of hell. If God ever moved in, if you ever opened the door when he knocked on your heart, he never leaves. That's the beauty of Christianity. So Christian, this is the good news that you should celebrate every day. Never means never. And you are never going to lose your salvation. And if you aren't a Christian, listen, <laughs> this is a deal. Have I got a deal for you? This is a deal you can't pass up. Surrender to Jesus. Admit that you're a sinner and that you need him to sa save you and you can gain a gift that you would never, ever, ever be able to earn. You receive it as a gift. I'm going to leave you with this quote by Jim Elliott. Jim Elliott was a, a missionary who was murdered, I think before he was 40. Loved the Lord, said some great stuff, taught, but always wanted to go to Ecuador to, be, uh, to evangelize and be a, a missionary. And um, he was there for several years and then uh, was making some inroads with a tribe there. And they set him up to meet a couple of leaders. And when he met the leaders, they just killed him. And guess what this guy said? You may have heard this phrase before. But he said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. So if you're not a Christian... When you come to Christ, what are you giving? You're just giving up. You're saying, Lord, I need help. You're giving up control in a sense of your life. You're saying, Lord, you take over. Listen, you can't keep it anyway. I mean, even if you're 10 years old, what do you have, 90 years left? And then it's over. So you can't keep control of your life. Only a fool would hang on to that. I want to be the master of my own fate, which you're not going to be able to do forever. And, and instead reject something you could never lose, the free gift of salvation. Jim Elliott saw it, and guess what? He ended up giving his life for it because he knew, I could lose everything, but I'm not ever going to lose this. And that's what you need to know. You're never going to lose it if you're a Christian. If you're not, I want you to pray with me right now. Pray something like this. You don't have to say it exactly like this. But if this has meant something to you and ministered to you, that's the Holy Spirit already tugging on your heart. And he wants to give you a gift that you can never, ever, ever lose. So pray something like this. Lord, I feel you touching my heart. And I believe you've already started to change me just through hearing your word today. So Lord, I ask you to come in. I know you're knocking. I can sense you're knocking. I know it for a fact, so I'm asking you to come in. I give up. I surrender. Take over, Lord. 
You're the King of kings and Lord of lords. You made me. You can run this life much better than I can. I want to yield to you. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for giving me a gift that I accept right now and receive that can never be taken away. Thank you that my destiny is secure permanently because of the perfect sacrifice of the cross. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all for tuning in. Check out next week when we're going to talk about God being mad at Christians, yet another lie. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.